Hello everyone, well it's back to school for kids and it looks like it's back to wintering grounds for many birds but summer is not over yet, we're still gardening. So we noticed that ever since we started feeding birds in our backyard and attracting them, our backyard has actually changed quite drastically. Birds have been gardening and planting all the things that they want. For example, we wanted to add some decor to our vegetable garden, so we brought an old cast iron bathtub, painted it blue, filled it with earth, and I wanted to plant sunflowers in honor of my native Ukraine. Well, I didn't have to plant anything because birds had already done that and sunflowers started growing as soon as it got warm outside in the spring, and now goldfinches are so happy harvesting those sunflowers. Another thing that we never planted in our backyard is choke cherry trees. They are native to North America and birds go absolutely crazy for their berries. Choke cherries are toxic to us when they are raw, but they were widely used when cooked by indigenous people. And there is actually a trend now where people are going around and collecting them and turning them into juices and jams and all kinds of syrups because choke cherries are really good for your immune system. Catbirds and robins normally clear out our trees that we have on our property. They start eating them as soon as berries start ripening. So I never actually get a chance to collect them, but this year they've left them alone. There's still some left and they have ripened for human consumption. They need to be almost black in color for us to use it. So this is what I'm rushing to do is pick some of them and turn them into juice. If you can find seedlings, fall is the best time to plant them. If not, collect the berries and plant them in the spring. We all know that some hummingbirds are rather territorial and will attack each other, but Norma Coney in the Catskills witnessed something rather extreme. A male hummingbird injuring other hummingbirds to the point that Norma had to bring a hummingbird to a wildlife rehab center. Hi Norma, I'm assuming from your place of residence in the Catskills that you are referring to ruby-throated hummingbirds, which are the main hummingbird species found in the east. I'm certainly not surprised to hear about the aggressive behavior witnessed in your birds. The most common adjective used to describe hummingbirds is pugnacious. However, most hostile behavior between any hummingbirds involves tail chases, sometimes the odd bit of physical contact with either the bill or the feet. But your wee male seems to have taken the latter to a much higher level. It actually wounded one of its competitors by injuring its shoulder with its bill while pinning it to the ground. I looked up my top source of scientific information on agonistic behavior between ruby throats, and there were no descriptions of actual physical injuries inflicted during these interactions. So what you saw was certainly an exception to the rule. Well, there's not much you can do about the bad temper and bullying behavior of your male. You did do the right thing by taking the injured bird to a wildlife rehabilitation clinic. I hope it recovered. Well, many folks would like to think that our birds stay with the same mate for life. It's simply not true. While 90% of bird species generally have a single mate for at least one breeding season, if not longer, some of these so-called monogamous species switch to a different partner the following breeding season, even when their original mate is still alive. Ornithologists studying this phenomenon use a term very familiar to humans to describe this behavior, divorce. And according to recent research, the very same key factors that lead to divorce in humans also affect birds, male promiscuity and lengthy spells apart. For the birds, long distance migration comprises the latter. To examine the roles of these two factors, a combined research team of scientists from Germany and China examined divorce rates in 232 bird species that had accompanying mortality data and engaged in long distance migration. They assigned a promiscuity score to the males and females. In addition, they carried out an analysis based on the evolutionary relationships between species to take into account the effect of common ancestry. They found that species with either notably high or low divorce rates tended to be closely related to each other. A similar pattern was seen for male promiscuity. For instance, plovers, swallows, martins, orioles and blackbirds had both high divorce rates and high male promiscuity whereas petrels, albatrosses, geese, and swans had low divorce rates and low male promiscuity. Interestingly, female promiscuity was not associated with higher divorce rates. 
The team also found that species with longer migration distances had a higher divorce rate. They explained their overall results like this. If a male is regarded as being overly promiscuous, he becomes regarded as a partner with reduced commitment and thus less attractive. In short, he ends up getting divorced a lot. As for long distance migrations, this can mean that the pair from last year might arrive in the breeding grounds at different times and end up with another partner. Or they might even end up landing at different sites and acquiring a new partner. All this to say, humans can still learn a thing or two from our feathered friends. These days, all I hear in our backyard is chip, 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 which means we have a lot of chipping sparrows, one of the most abundant sparrows here in the New World. They breed all over North America, so you probably have plenty of them as well. My backyard with mixed trees, brush piles, overgrown areas and bushes is just ideal for them. I often hear, oh, I just have brown sparrows at my bird feeders, but if you start looking closer, you'll be surprised how many different species of sparrows you actually have. So let's compare again the three sparrows that are the most common right now and that get confused the most. The American tree sparrow, the chipping sparrow, and the sun sparrow. So the chipping sparrow has a very dark, almost black beak and a black eyebrow. The American tree sparrow has a bicolored beak and a brown eyebrow. And then the sun sparrow is kind of dotted and spotted all over the place with this nice distinct dot right on its chest. Chipping sparrows love seeds and grass and some insects as well. We often see them under our bird feeders. Chipping sparrows might be a little birds, but they are very territorial and males waste no time when they arrive in their breeding grounds to establish their territory. Once thought to be rather monogamous, more research is showing that fidelity is not that big a priority in both sexes. Chipping sparrows love building their nests in coniferous trees and some of them might even attempt another brood in August. That's why I recommend not touching your trees until nesting season is over, sort of in September. They normally have two broods, four eggs, and they often become good parents to brown-headed cowbirds. Well, birds and trees sounds like a very generic photo theme, but we saw such a wide variety of habitats and birds. Let's check out the top five. Here's the third place, the second place, and the grand prize winner. Congratulations, everybody. September is Plovers and Lapwings. Well, that's it, that's all for now. Please let me know how helpful birds have been with gardening jobs in your backyard. Take care, everyone. I'll catch you in two weeks.